Okay, so let's go back to it. Uh, so now we have uh, Madhu and Jana who are going to talk about uh, Docker networking. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Madhu Venugopal. Uh, I work on Docker networking and a few other things in Docker Inc. Uh, so so far, we have been um, uh, we have been developing Docker networking features for the past few releases, and in all the conferences that we have given talks, it's always about high-level Docker networking stuff, about management plane, which I'm going to cover what it is, about UX, how to configure features, and stuff like that. But today, the crowd has been like, amazing. Like We can go deeper, deep dives into how it, is, how it actually works. So uh, today's uh, agenda is going to be about, I'm going to cover the uh, uh, definition of what is control plane and data plane is all about in networking, and what we mean by uh, the planes in, in the Docker networking as well. While Jana is going to take the bunch, most of the time going much more deeper into how we actually do things. Right? right? That's, that's, that's going to be a really fun talk. So let's get right there. So I promise it's a only slide. It's kind of markety, but uh, after this is going to be completely technical. Um, so the reason that we have this slide is that to just to uh, 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 to break the ice here to explain what are the features that we have added so far from Docker 1.7, which when I, when we joined uh, Docker, uh, till Docker 1.12, the the latest release with Swarm mode. Uh, another thing is if you look at all the items here. Each one can be easily categorized under control plane, data plane, management plane. It's important to highlight it here and then map it later so that we understand why the networking thing is complex, right? So based on the features that we can understand here. So when we started 1.7, uh, we didn't actually start implementing the, the OLA networking or the load balancing. We took it slow. We started implementing the actual framework required for implementing uh, solid and extensible networking framework for Docker. Uh, so we started with the Lib Network project with uh, CNM as our base model for uh, implementing uh, the networking solution. And we first migrated all the existing bridge host, uh, uh, non-host uh, divers. So those divers, note it down, the divers are important uh, when it comes to data plane, which we'll cover uh, in the deep dive. Then we started implementing more control plane, control plane stuff, like service discovery is a control plane feature. Uh, for, uh, initially, we started with host, then we migrated to a DNS-based uh, solution in 1.10. So come 1.9, we implemented a new driver called overlay driver, again, a data plane feature, uh, for implementing multi-host networking out of the box in Docker, including the, the classic swarm mode as well. Uh, also, if you look at it, we have network, uh, network plugins. Again, network plugins are data, pl data plane features uh, at this point. And IPAM plugin and a management plane and the network UX is another management, uh, management plane feature. So as you can see here, uh, Docker networking is a, is a full stack, full networking stack for Docker. It covers management plane, control plane, and data plane. And of course, uh, in 112, we implemented load balancers, encrypted control plane data plane uh, paths, we have routing mesh, swarm mode networking, and we have you know, round robin balancing, so on and so forth. So lots of features which implement the full stack of networking. But before going into the details of uh, the control plane data plane, I'd like to take some time explaining exactly what control plane data plane means when it comes to networking. It's important to understand this one so that uh, uh, we can appreciate why the networking is, uh, solutions are a bit complex when it comes to uh, understanding the solutions. So I want to go bottom up, uh, especially after following Thomas Graf's uh, presentation. Uh, most of the talk that he had was about data plane, essentially. It's about data plane is about actually moving your packet from A to B. For any application, if, you, if an application wants to talk to another application, those traffic that is when tra traffic goes from your laptop to a server and back, that is kind of data plane. It's the actual moment of traffic, application traffic. Um, so when we talk to uh, new application developers, uh, they think networking as, yeah, sending packet from A to B, right? So originally, initially I say yes, and then I say, yeah, right, right? Because uh, if you look at data plane, it, it has a lot more complexity there. Uh, like as, as, as you know, the natting, the security aspects, the no uh, IPv6, IPv4, load balancing, so on and so forth. Um, so since the uh, data plane level, the most important thing is 
speeds and feeds, right? It has to be, it has to be really, really fast. As, as he was talking about, we have nanoseconds to make a decision on at every hop. So every router, every switch that you know on the hardware, every single network stack in the, in the uh, devices, network entities, including the laptops, the Linux uh, boxes, the IP tables, everything is tuned for speed. And hence, we cannot afford to have any uh, latency sensitive code uh, in there. So if you look at the uh, data plane, typically you see things like IP tables, IPVS tables, OVS data path, DPDK, BPF, loading tables. These are all tables where you can actually program uh, pre-processed information. And the information is right there in the table when, that, when the actual packet hits that data path. The lookup, the lookup is the one where the actual time, take, time is taken, actually. So the lookup is highly critical for a data path, a data plane. So all the security is also involved there. So when you do a lookup, you do a forwarding lookup, you do policy lookups, you do QoS lookups, so on and so forth. And also NAT table, translation, and you know, stuff like that. So uh, when those who, are, those who are, uh, understand the Docker bridge networking, uh, we used to say that, hey, NATing is bad. Uh, port mapping is like terrible and stuff like that. It's only because that at, at the data plane level, this, all this matters. Every cycle matters. So NATing is about rewriting the packet. So it's, it's highly critical that if you rewrite the packet, of course you have to pay for, for the body performance, really. So that's where data, data plane comes. So the reason we have the, the arrows here is about packet is coming in, packet is going out. So the quicker we dispatch the packet out, the better. That is data plane. So let's go to the control plane there. So what is control plane? Um, so if the data plane has to work really, really well, really, really fast, we want a better controller on top which pre-programs the data path effectively so that when the traffic comes in, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about, hey, how to actually forward the packet, right? We don't have to think about it at all. Control plane works really well by signaling between the network entities and exchange the routing, uh, the reachability states. So if there is a container that comes up with an IP address, Another container comes up in another host in a, in a cluster, and if they want to talk to each other, we want the most efficient control plane algorithm which can exchange information about, hey, there's a new container that's come up on a particular host. If you want to reach that uh, container, you have to take a, a particular route. So that is control plane, where we have various protocols like the OSPF, BGP. These are the traditional protocols that implemented by, by the vendors and uh, uh, these are all RFC ratified. And uh, the new age, things like gossip-based protocol, which we have used in, in Docker. Uh, also, there are centralized protocols like OpenFlow and OVSDB. These are the uh, quote-unquote SDN mechanisms where uh, there is no, the control plane is not distributed. It's a centralized control plane. There's a controller sitting up there which instructs the, all the uh, networking devices to send the packet from A to B through a, through a path. So in addition to all this, uh, uh, stuff like uh, uh, the, the netlink, which is required to configure the IP table rules, those are all part of the control plane. So uh, uh, in addition, if data plane is important for the speeds and feeds, control plane is about performance and scale. So we, we better have a strong control plane that can really, really scale well and perform really, really nicely for a Container like, like workload where containers can come and go, services can be created, can be scaled up and down, uh, should be load balanced, so on and so forth. So, control plane is all about performance and scale. And of course, work much better with the data plane in, at hand so that when the traffic hits the, wi uh, the wire, we don't, have, we don't have any packet loss at all. So, the control plane is critical in those aspects. Now, when it comes to management plane, as I said, uh, all my all our previous talks was all about management plane. We give demos about yeah, we have a cool UI, yeah, we have this uh, great UX. We have uh, tools for managing it. We have uh, REST APIs. We have SNMP to manage things. It's all about operationalized things. So operators and tools, if they want to manage a network infrastructure, if they want to do a monitoring, if they want to do troubleshooting, those all come under the management plane. Uh, so for this talk, we are going to concentrate on control plane and data plane. So this is a very generic overview of what is these two planes are in, in, in when it comes to networking. When it comes to Docker networking, uh, uh, to narrow down on Docker networking, I try to map uh, some of the Docker elements, components, into this uh, three planes. Again, going to the data plane uh, going up. Uh, data plane is all about 
uh, today we have the network plugins and built-in drivers. So the way we have approached, Docker has approached the data planes about any uh, network dr driver you see in Live Network, like the bridge driver, overlay driver, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, host, so on and so forth, and the BPF that uh, is working on. Also, any other plugin that you know, Weave or you know, uh, uh, Calico, so on and so forth. All of them we will categorize as a data plane because uh, networking is a, is a complex place, of course. As I said, data planes uh, requirement is to have the speeds and feeds. The, so there are various requirements for different technologies where people might need uh, flexibility, so they will go with overlay networking. Uh, but if folks have a better uh, idea of what their underlay is, if they are clear about, okay, my underlay is going to be a purely L2, L, L2 switch or a L3 fabric, then they can go with a different solution. For example, Mac VLAN, IP VLAN. Or if somebody is very clear about, okay, my deployment is going to be a kernel version 3.19 and above, so they can afford to do BPF-based technologies, really, right? So data plane is about, again, uh, it's, all about, it's all a balance between the features and uh, the deployments. So uh, we can choose what they actually really want and then decide on the data plane plugins they, 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 they prefer. The control plane is a critical component in Docker. This is where most of our coding goes in. Because in, in Docker, all the drivers that we implement, we use the Linux kernel and the Windows kernel as the way for us to do packet forwarding. So we don't actually do any coding on the data path itself for us to, to, for us to do the actual networking. We make use of the Linux features for us to get, the, the, get these features for free, essentially. When it comes to control plane, uh, the control plane is today managed by the LibNetwork core. We call it LibNetwork core is the place where we implement the entire gossip protocol that we have today in SwarmKit. And uh, the SwarmKit uh, allocator, uh, and uh, uh, there are a few components in SwarmKit which is part of the control plane. So the uh, Jana will cover more details on the network scope gossip, where uh, instead of using a BGP or a, uh, a traditional protocol, we went with a different mechanism to do exchange the, the route information. So we use the uh, swim-based gossip protocol. And uh, server discovery is built in by default. We have uh, DNS, embedded DNS uh, in, the, uh, in Docker. And containers actually make use of the server discovery that is built in Docker itself. So it's also part of control plane. And we have the encrypted uh, key distribution that uh, Diego was talking about in the previous talk. It's all about, it's all fully integrated into the SwarmKit and uh, Docker, where when, a, when uh, two different control plane, when the two different uh, uh, Docker engines are to talk to each other, it's fully encrypted thanks to the, uh, the, the key distribution built in this SwarmKit itself. Uh, so one more thing to add here. The control plane we, uh, the control plane is actually uh, a service provided by Lib Network. So any plugin that is being used here can make use of the control plane as well, the, uh, the Docker control plane, for them to distribute states as well. So it's very useful that way. If plugins can make use of the same control plane, the control plane is actually in sync with the, the rest of the Docker swarm. So there, there, there won't be any uh, case where the Docker Swarm kit has a different view of the topology, and the, and the networking has a different view of topology. It's always consistent, always there. So we recommend the plugins to make use of the, the control plane uh, service that we offer, so that it's always consistent, essentially. And again, a management plane is all about the not Docker network UX, APIs, and uh, management plugins. Uh, so we have management plugins like the IPAM plugin today, and we can, of course, extend uh, the plugin layers. Uh, so tomorrow, in the in the in the uh, bit of further, we want to talk about various components where we can actually do plugins. So today, as I said, the plugins was today mostly on the data plane and all on the management plane. We don't have any plugins on the control plane layer. So it'll be a great session tomorrow if if folks have any interest on control plane plugins. We can talk about it. We can exchange notes and we can do more stuff. Okay. So as I promised, I'm going to stop talking now, and it's going to be a deep dive which Jenna is going to carry over. Thanks, Madhu. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, Thomas, because it was a good talk. And thanks, accept, thanks for accepting the invite, actually. Um, I mean, if only we can like, you know, use this upgrade from 310 kernel to like, you know, 4R2 or something like that. 
we can actually all go to BPF, but that's not the case. So we have to kind of use uh, uh, you know, whatever is supported in Freeturn, and um, uh, you know, we actually kind of built all our um, solutions for supporting older kernels from Freeturn onwards and things like that. So having said that, let's go to the um, uh, deep dive on the control plane. So, I mean, um, control plane components, there is a couple of different things that uh, make up uh, the network control plane. Um, we have some things that happen centralized in a centralized manner. Um, basically, the resources and uh, policy definition. Uh, when we say policy definition, I'm really talking about the networks, because in our language, in Docker language, each and every network is actually a policy. Uh, so all those definitions of networks and uh, allocations of resources for those networks and things like that, those things happen in a centralized manner in the managers. And then we have uh, a completely peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized, uh, gossip-based uh, state dissemination uh, between all the nodes in the swarm cluster. Um, that is actually used for any kind of eventual consistent uh, state dissemination. We'll talk in detail about both these things. Uh, I'm not going to cover a whole lot on the centralized resources and policies. I mean, we've gone through the whole swarm kit uh, data model. Um, uh, essentially, uh, pretty much this whole uh, centralized network resource management and allocation is all built on top of that. Um, Stephen, Andrea, and uh, Aaron actually talked a whole lot about that. Um, uh, the one thing that I want to say actually over there is that uh, those uh, that is a that is a pipeline stage in uh, in the uh, in the in the managers called the allocator which basically kind of is responsible for any kind of policy definition, which is network creation, and resource allocation for those things, which is IP subnet allocation. When you do a Docker network create, um, you are automatically getting some IP subnet allocated, actually. Uh, we basically want to provide that option to the user. I mean, the goal of uh, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that the users don't need to worry about subnet management or IP address management um, or anything that is related to networking, actually. Uh, basically, you know, just tie, tie their application intention to what they want to achieve and uh, use network as a policy to achieve that, actually. Right? So to do those kind of things, we need to do centralized allocations, and we do those, those, those things uh, in the allocator in the, in the manager. So basically, um, we can actually mutate state in the manager, of course, only if the managers are available. So just being, these being, um, by nature, centralized, you have to have your uh, manager availability um, to do those kind of things. Um, so once those allocations have happened, uh, they basically, those, those resources and all the kind of information is downloaded into the, um, into the workers for running their tasks uh, whenever a particular task is allocated or, or assigned a particular task. So that, that's pretty much uh, what happens in the centralized resources and uh, policies. In future, we can basically def define new policies, which are not, which are not just networks, but maybe more fine-grained policies and things like that. And uh, those things as well will go into that. And of course, there is uh, an avenue of like, you know, opening up that API for plugin management and all that kind of stuff in the future. But what I'm going to talk in more detail is the, is the decentralized part of uh, networking, actually. Uh, this is basically what we call as network control plane. Uh, before going into exactly what this is, I just want to kind of uh, provide some information on why, why did we not choose some other routing protocol or something like that, like BGP or something like that. Um, the fundamental reason is the, the way infrastructure is set up you know, for you know, a Docker cluster and things like that, it's very dynamic. You, don't, you, don't, you want to design your, um, your, uh, your solution in such a way that you don't actually have a lot of assumption about the infrastructure itself. Um, if you try to use you know, a routing protocol like BGP, uh, you have to get into uh, making some assumptions about the infrastructure, basically. Uh, for example, let's say we use IBGP. Um, how many IBGP instance, instances would you use, right? If you use IBGP, there is uh, the problem of trying to make a full mesh connection of all the nodes in the cluster, which means you have to run, you know, if there are n nodes, you have to run n, n IBGP instances and n squared full mesh peers, which is completely unscalable. Um, if you want to run eBGP, which is actually the, the protocol which is used to um, distribute information to your internet, the core, internet core, 
uh, you are actually uh, basically uh, you have to kind of use a route reflector kind of a mechanism, which is again coming back to your availability problem. So, so there are kind of practical limitations in trying to use a, a traditional routing protocol for our purposes for distributing routing state in uh, in a distributed uh, uh, network control plane that we have designed. So what we do, we kind of designed a, a, a solution based on a package uh, based on an implementation of uh, a protocol. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little, little, little bit later, actually, in, uh, in the next slide. But uh, um, really, it's a Gossip-based protocol uh, in, in the sense that it, it scales. If it, as, as somebody actually, like, I think the Infinite guys, actually, when they talked about the peer-to-peer -peer model and things like that, it's exactly similar in terms of like, learning the cluster membership and things like that. Um, it scales from one node to 10,000 nodes in exactly the same way. Um, that is. There is no uh, perceivable difference uh, when you actually go from one node to 10,000 nodes when you try to uh, use that protocol. Um, so that's why it's, it's, it's the convergence times are fast. Um, it's highly scalable, as I talked about. Um, and most importantly, this whole cluster will actually function even if your managers are down. Uh, this is very important because you know, you, your managers still needed to mutate state. You need to mutate tasks and things like that. But what if? You have a load balancer orchestrated into your cluster, and uh, the managers are down, but one of your application instances is also down. You need to be able to recover from that and reconfigure and self-heal your cluster without your managers actually being available. So, so that kind of availability is actually guaranteed by this solution. Um, so, what is, uh, so getting into detail of how gossip uh, works in detail, um, so it's, uh, it's, as I said, it's completely decentralized uh, discovery of cluster nodes. So what we do is for cluster membership, we use uh, a protocol called SWIM. It's scalable, weakly consistent, infection-style process group membership protocol, which is, which is actually used in, um, in a few places, basically. It's used um, in console, uh, in surf. Um, it's used in, um, I think Uber has a, has a package called RingPop. They use it actually over there. Um, it is basically a highly scalable way to discover your cluster, your membership of the cluster and things like that. We use the underlying mechanism of that. Uh, actually, we use HashiCorp's member list package uh, to, to kind of like, you know, get the cluster view on any node, basically. Uh, once we get the cluster membership, we, we actually try to you know, def um, uh, learn the cluster membership at two levels. The, one, the first thing is the swarm level, which is actually something that we kind of like leverage HashiCorp's member list package. But also, uh, we want to kind of um, define subclusters based on the network level, actually, based on how, what, are the, what are the nodes which actually are participating on the, on the particular network. Um, so the reason why we want to do that is because we want to actually like reduce the amount of network traffic or the message load, the so-called message load um, in the network. Uh, when you are only interested on the, on the network information that, for the network that you are participating in. Because the networks are actually like really policies and uh, every network is not something that every node participates in. Not every node needs to understand or like learn about information about networks that it doesn't participate in. So, th so kind of that's an optimization that we have done. So, so as I said, we built on top of HashiCorp's uh, member list package, which is implementation of a weekly consistent uh, state dissemination protocol. Uh, but weakly consistent means uh, it's not going to be useful exactly uh, as it is for us, right? Because weakly consistent means you're, you're going to get out-of-order packets, uh, out-of-order state uh, notifications. So we actually kind of have to build up a sequential, I mean, a, a layer built on top of a Lamport clock uh, on top of that to make that state dissemination sequentially consistent, meaning whenever some state updates happen on a particular node, you actually get, receive information about that uh, in the order in which that happened on that node. Um, and then uh, the other property that we have um, is that uh, there, can, there can only be a single writer at a the, at the per record or entry level. I mean, there's a lot of different states that actually kind of gets distributed in gossip, uh, namely you know, service discovery information, load balancing information, routing information, things like that. Um, but there is only one writer per record. So because of that, the whole problem actually becomes much simpler, meaning if there is, there is not going to be a conflict across 
nodes because there is only one writer for that particular record. Um, overall, what's the convergence time? What is convergence time here? Definition of convergence time is that you know, in a ten, in a in an n number node, how fast the the state that is kind of published in a particular node gets uh, learned by everybody, right? That's the convergence time, and um, and, and the convergence time is roughly a, a, a O log n time actually. It's not completely O log n. It's like when n tends to infinity, it becomes O log n. But just in all practical cases, it is actually O log n. Um, okay, so so gossip. That's 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 the main parts of gossip actually, but uh, one of the things that gossip needs to do is uh, do proper failure detection, like proper failure detection in a prompt manner. Um, if a node fails, you need to learn about that much more quickly. I mean, if if a, if an application instance goes away, you would actually learn about that immediately because the gossip layer is still active on that node. But if the node goes away, there needs to be um, better mechanisms to kind of uh, uh, learn about that pretty quickly. Um, so again, um, the the Swin protocol kind of like you know helps us there actually. Um, so essentially, the way it works is uh, it basically a node which actually has a view of, of of the whole cluster membership. It shuffles the 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 the, the node list into some randomized um, list of nodes, and then it round robins on every node on that actually um, to to do a probe. Uh, if the probe succeeds, all is good. It moves on to the next node uh, on the next uh, ping time or whatever. If the node fails, um, it could be that the node is failing, or it could be a transient problem, right? We don't know actually. So what it does is it doesn't automatically move the node to you know a the node is dead or something like that, but basically it moves the node to a suspect state. Um, the reason is because um, you know of course you know networks can have message losses and things like that, and you have to differentiate between what exactly is a message loss and what uh, what exactly is a node failure. So when the mood when the, the node goes to suspect um, thing, it it broadcasts that message um, to other nodes, not the node that it's failing, but the other nodes, which it picks up randomly again, um, and those guys will actually like you know broadcast to others, and they all start they, they all start the suspect timer at the same time. Um, if they didn't hear about, um, but if the node which actually, it, the, the information also goes to the node which is actually failing, if it is possible, right? So if the node which is failing receives the message, it can refute the node uh, message. So when it refutes the message, all is good, things come back, and everything becomes alive. If it's not, the suspect timeout expires, and the node moves to the dead node, dead, dead state. And at that point, the node is actually removed from the cluster. Once the node is removed from the cluster, all the state that is learned from that node disappears. And this is fundamentally how um, a node detection influences the state that you learn about the node. This actually includes all the routing information from that you learn from the node, all the load balancing information that you learn from the node, um, or, or all service discovery information that you learn from the node. All of those actually things disappear when the node actually goes dead. Okay, so we talked about the um, failure detection, but how does the state dissemination itself actually work? We talked about how state is like purged when there is like a node failure or something like that. But what happens during a normal, uh, typical scenario, basically, right? Um, you know, when a node starts, you know, creating some new state, it publishes that state. Um, it is broadcast. So the way the the, the whole gossip works is basically like chooses three random nodes and broadcasts that information to those particular three random nodes. Um, it, it, does by, it does so by actually like updating the Lamport time of that particular entry to a newer time based on the Lamport clock that is running actually on that particular node. Because there is only one writer for that entry, that Lamport time for that particular entry is singly managed by that particular node. So there is no conflict in the Lamport time itself. So once the other node actually receives these um, entries, it actually checks whether these entries are like stale or um, newer, newer entries, basically based on the lamp time of the information that it has already. Actually, if it is something that is new, it'll accept it, and then if it accepts it, it'll rebroadcast that information to you know three other nodes. I mean, three is the replication factor, but you can configure that to any any, any number. But um, based on the replication factor, the convergence time goes down. But three is actually what we have kind of found out actually as the as the optimal number. 
for the kind of convergence time that you want. Um, so this way, actually, the, the information gets um, um, propagated across the whole node. So that's not the only thing that happens. Remember, all this state dissemination that happens, it happens in UDP. It is not TCP. I mean, the reason why it's UDP is because um, this information, this state dissemination can happen um, at rapid rate. Uh, and that is, if you start actually having TCP connections um, across your nodes, you are basically uh, getting into, uh, because you cannot actually have TCP connections across all the nodes in the cluster in a fully meshed topology, because then you were actually like kind of get into stale problem, uh, scale problem. Um, so what you do is actually instead uh, use UDP as a mechanism to send those uh, information. But of course, UDP is an unreliable protocol, so it can actually have problems either in packet loss or queuing delay, and because of that, the packet get lost, and it can be a vicious cycle and things like that. So, so that is a backup mechanism uh, to kind of uh, um, um, to make sure that the packet, that the state actually is fully synced across the cluster, which is basically a periodic. Uh, the period is a, a, it's a much larger period um, of a bulk sync of the entire state. The bulk, the entire state gets downloaded into a, a different random node. Again, you have to think about all these things in such a way that all this information, all these things are actually happening in parallel in all the nodes, right? So. So when I'm, when I'm saying there is a bulk sync, or when there is a probe of a node or something like that, all these things are happening um, in every node. right? So basically, they're all choosing um, a random node to send their information to. Actually, it looks like this randomization is very pr pretty effective. And this is actually what the SWIM protocol actually was uh, trying to prove. This randomization is very effective in trying to converge the, um, the state much faster even though it's random, and even though you might actually pick up a node which actually already received this state, um, it, it is really effective, even in a, in, a, in a less number of nodes. The same mechanism that actually is effective for uh, you know, an algorithm like QuickSort to be a very effective algorithm in terms of like average time. OK, so, so that's control plane. Let's talk about data plane. Um, OK, so in the data plane, um, w well, in data plane, I mean, I'm not going to talk about like, you know, Bridges and things like that, because I think you know a lot of people have, are probably knowledgeable knowledgeable about that. Let's talk about the overlay uh, data plane. Before talking about the overlay data plane, I just want to say why we chose overlay as our default um, default uh, plugin for multi-host networking, uh, default driver for multi-host networking. The reason for that is that overlay is such a good protocol uh, to remove or decouple your infrastructure assumptions. You can run it on any infrastructure and it just works, right? I mean we have. Literally, actually, not done nothing to actually enable um, uh, swarm mode in Docker for AWS or Docker for Azure or you, you name you name any public cloud provider anywhere. Actually, it'll just work. Actually, that's that's one of the keys that that actually like made us choose uh, overlay. And some people actually are 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 are, are basically like um, uh, concerned about the performance overhead and things like that. I just want to say that uh, there is an overhead. Uh, of about 5% in terms of encapsulation and decapsulation overhead of, uh, of using uh, VXLAN. We'll talk about VXLAN over the, 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 the packet protocol and things like that a little bit real. But that overhead is really uh, at the 5% to 10% um, level. But the real overhead is really on the, on the bridge that we use. I mean, bridges actually inherently you know, increase the overhead. Uh, the reason for that is anytime you do a, a lookup, any kind of memory lookup, you actually kind of um, are limited at some point, basically. Um, for example, the Linux in a on a modern processor, um, a single core performance of a Linux bridge would be about about four gig or um, about 780 kilopackets per second, right? But uh, the important thing to understand here is that that's a single core performance. Your applications are not going to just use a single core. If your if your server has like eight cores, you're going to have containers running on eight cores. So even if you have a 10 gig pipe, you should be able to saturate the 10 gig pipe using overlay network. So there's no problem. unless you have a situation, special situation, where you have a single application trying to saturate a 10 gig pipe and it's, it can only use single core, right? So that's where you should be concerned. And if you are really concerned about that, at that point you should just use host networking because that's that's the best overlay net multi-host networking. Um, so what's what's overlay made of actually? Um, it's made of VXLAN. Uh, if you if you uh, don't know what VXLAN is, it's a, it's it's an enhancement of 
when when people and you know start getting into the limitations of VLAN, they kind of invented VXLAN. But its purposes have been re it has been repurposed to like a whole lot of different things to be done. Um, and um, and uh, I mean one of the things that it actually helps is make sure that your upstream switches or routers, their their uh, TCAMs are not stressed. I mean if you don't have an overlay network, you have a top of the rack switch and you have you know a limited number of TCAM entries over there, like 128k or something like that. If you have if you have like one more than 128,000 containers and you want to like you know route those. Uh, you know, insert those uh, routes for those things or MAC addresses for those things in those top of the rack switches, it just won't scale. Instead, if you just have an overlay network, your infrastructure can just be any scale. It can be a low and top, top of the rack switch. It'll just work. So these are the benefits of overlay network, actually, which, which just makes, makes it work in any infrastructure, as I said. It'll just work in a layer 2 network, a layer 3 network, IPv4 network, or IPv6 network. Um, and, you know, it has all those properties, actually. One of the good, good, good things about VXLAN is also that it's a point to multipoint tunnel, meaning you don't actually create a full mesh connection. You don't create a VXLAN interface for every pair of hosts that you're trying to communicate. You just have a single VXLAN interface for every VLAN ID, and it basically broadcasts or point, it creates a point to multipoint traffic connection to all the uh, other nodes whenever possible based on the MAC table lookup. Um, one of the problems with VLAN or L2 domain is that um, when you actually like want to process broadcast unknown unicast packets or multicast, you call this whole thing as bum traffic or multicast packets, it's very difficult. Meaning you have to do uh, either you know, replication of the packet at the source, which is like CPU intensive, or you have, to do, you have to resort to some kind of multicast, which means your underlay has to support multicast. Uh, most of the infrastructure providers like uh, Amazon or something like that, they won't actually support multicast. So it's really not, um, it's a non-starter to try to use Try to, cross, try to actually send out, send out your broadcast packets or multicast packets into the wire. So what we do instead is we actually like um, uh, leverage something called proxy ARP. So whenever, um, so basically we, we just make sure that no packets ever need to, no broadcast packets ever need to get out of the uh, wire. So the, the main pro broadcast packet that everybody is, um, everybody needs is the ARP broadcast actually, right? I mean you have to actually find out what the MAC address for your destination IP and things like that. That information is resolved by using proxy ARP on the same node itself, actually. Uh, we use, our, again, our control plane to kind of learn that information across the cluster and then program that information into the, uh, into the local node. So whenever there's an ARP broadcast that happens for that particular IP, it gets resolved on that node itself. So there is no broadcast that's going out of the wire. Um, so what we do, how we achieve that, we kind of create, uh, I, I want to just skip this uh, slide and just go to a, a visual representation of that. We basically, um, we basically create a network namespace and uh, uh, we create a bridge inside that. And that bridge uh, is basically the L2 extension point for this whole overlay network. All your containers which are participating in the overlay network are connected to the bridge, meaning the one end of the Vth pair of that container is actually in the container namespace. The other end of the Vth pair is on that network namespace where the bridge is. Um, so if you are trying to go and look at your host namespace, namespace for that Vth pair, you won't find it. Um, and then we actually create the VXLAN interface on the host networking stack and then move it into the, in this network name, namespace, the one, um, oops. Yeah, the, this is the network namespace. Uh, and uh, so, so basically what happens is when you actually create the VXLAN interface outside the host namespace and move it here, your VXLAN outside encapsulation gets processed in the host namespace stack. And the packet, which is actually the inner packet, gets processed inside the, inside the inner namespace. So when a container is trying to send a packet, let's say, to C4 from C1, it's going to do an R broadcast. So when the R broadcast comes here, this bridge is going to flood that packet, actually, because it's a broadcast. Um, it's going to send it to, you know, via this interface, via this interface, and VXLAN, actually. Those interfaces don't have the information, so they just ignore the broad our broadcast. But the VXLAN interface sees the information and sees that, OK, I know about this IP, and I know, the, I know what MAC is this, because we have actually kind of pushed that information into this VXLAN device, basically. So it'll send a formulated ARP reply um, back to the container one with the MAC address and things like that. So and then the guy actually sends 
the, uh, orig the, the original IP packet with the, uh, the, f with the correct MAC address into the bridge. And uh, again, it gets flooded because there is no information about that in the bridge, so it floods it basically. Again, it's come to the VXLAN, but the VXLAN knows about this particular MAC address, and it uh, encapsulates the information, and it knows exactly how to send that packet to this host, Nick, basically. And that is the VTOP of that uh, VXLAN. And it sends the packet over here in an encapsulated format in a VXLAN UDP encapsulation. And the packet comes here, and when it comes here, it decapsulates that, and it gets into this bridge, basically, and this bridge will send it to this, um, the bridge is trying to, because the, the bridge might already know that this MAC address is for this C4, because it might have learned it uh, when it actually kind of seen a packet before from here, so it will actually try to forward this packet to this C4. So that's, in essence, how you know, our old end token solution works. So in essence, you could say that there is two bridges involved uh, in achieving the, uh, the forwarding here. Um, so you are actually limited about the through, based on the throughput of that, those two bridges. But the thing is, uh, even those through bridges, they actually run at four gig um, throughput, single core throughput. So uh, unless you have a really um, uh, big applic monolith application trying to send a lot of packets, this should be good enough for most of them. Okay, so that's how whole works. Um, um, and uh, I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to just uh, run through some uh, other packet path in terms of load balancing and things like that. Um, load balancing, the, the, the amount of... Uh, um, of course, you know, um, Thomas talked about how BPF is like uh, uh, much flexible in terms of implementing load balancer and things like that. But we actually have used IPVS as our load balancer um, um, thing. But it's not—it's not bad actually. It's not as great as eBPF maybe, but it's not bad in the sense. Um, what we try to do in terms of load balancing is uh, something called client-side load balancing, meaning uh, we don't try to send um, a load balancer request to a central load balancing entity which does the load balancing and sends that information uh, to the real backend. Uh, that is really like, you know, that are available to problems and you're, you're, that, that particular load balancing instance becomes a bottleneck and things like that. What we do instead is plumb the IPVS instance into the directly to the source container which is trying to um, source that request. So what you have is really, um, you have the load balancing instance replicated across all the containers which have to, which, 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 which need to actually at some point reach that particular service. So, so they make the decision uh, on that local node, basically local, local container, on how to actually load balance that particular request. Um, so that way, you can completely distribute your load balancing problem, basically. Um, so I just want to kind of show you in kind of a pictorial representation of how that works. Uh, I just made the same mistake. <laughs> um, so so it, this is actually an example of internal load balancing that I was talking about. This is actually the container that is trying to uh, do load balancing. If you look at it, there is an IPVS instance actually running inside the container itself, basically. And there is an exact replica of this IPVS instance for every service that is part of that service, part of the network, on every container that is participating on that network, basically. So which means every client, every client is actually individually load balancing by itself. Um, but before actually doing the load balancing, it needs to find out the um, virtual IP of the load balancer, right? So. So what we do is we actually kind of apply the embedded DNS. Um, so it kind of resolves the uh, name for the service, uh, which actually is, is something the DNS server is running inside the daemon, actually. But how does it know about this, right? So what we do is we kind of use a trick to kind of set up the resolve.com to 127.0.0.11, uh, which gets trapped to, to the actual uh, socket, which is listening on the DNS request from the daemon inside the namespace. So even the daemon is actually running in host namespace, namespace attack, the socket it creates to listen, the listener socket it creates to receive this DNS res, response res request actually is running on that container namespace. So there is, there is a socket for every container, actually. Um, so when it results, then it receives the request from this particular socket, it knows exactly where this particular request is coming from. So that is the, that is the way, actually, we kind of uh, uh, resolve unqualified names. If somebody says, you know, somebody actually kind of demoed in the morning, the Prometheus person, um, how actually, like, you know, he has used uh, the, the unqualified name of, like, uh, of, to resolve uh, his, uh, his uh, Prometheus service. Uh, the way it works is because he is actually on the container which is participating in the network, and that context is known f based on the socket it, the request is received, we actually know exactly in which context this request is being um, generated, actually. So we basically generate the response based on that context. Um, 
So once you actually resolve the virtual IP, a proper virtual IP based on that, uh, we do some uh, mangled table rules uh, to mark that packet to based on the based on the VIP and things like that, and then the IPv6 matches that particular mark and then finds the right backend and then sends the packet over the overlay network using the overlay path that we talked about and then sends over here. So one of the things about one of the important um, advantages of doing this way is that I mean. Um, IP tables actually are not scalable, right? We have to be careful in how we use IP tables. We have to, if we actually have like 10,000 rules, IP table rules, it's going to be a linear, linked, linear search, right? I mean, if, you, if, you're, if your rule is like the 10,000th entry, you're going to have a packet, I mean, penalty for every connection request that you're going to um, uh, initiate. So instead, you want to kind of limit the number of IP table rules you want to search at any point in time. So that's why, you know, all these rules actually are, on a, are network scoped. On, and inside your container, actually. So, I mean, if the container, if the, if, if the services that are participating in the network are limited, your IP table entries are also limited, and and they just it just needs to check on those rules that are actually uh, relevant for that network. It doesn't need to check on the rules which are not relevant on the network. So that's an optimization. Given the limitation of IP tables, we have to kind of make those design decisions to make sure that we don't actually incur too much overhead on IP tables and things like that. So, as I said, um, um, that's. The IPvS, uh, you know, just looks at the mark, um, and the mark can be like marked on two different ways based on the WIP, and uh, we'll see in the next slide. Um, I'm, I'm not going to explain what routing meshes. I mean, if you've already known, um, if you have been to DockerCon, I think we've uh, gone through that thing and running out of time actually. So I just need to kind of explain how routing mesh and ingress load balancing differs from internal load balancing. It doesn't differ by too much. If you look at it, it actually does very similar things. Uh, except that the source of the packet is actually an ingress sandbox. This is not a container. This is just a network namespace. Um, um, it doesn't actually run an application or anything like that. It is just a namespace which is existing in the kernel, inside the kernel. So when a packet comes in, it comes in on a particular published port. This is the port that is like external phasing port or something like that. Uh, well, the moment it sees a published port, any node actually sees the published port, it actually knows that, okay, this I know about this published port. I need to send it to the ingress sandbox via the in the gateway bridge, and uh, again, we just do a marking. I mean, the same mark that we kind of created on the internal load balancing, the same mark is, uh, that, this, that is exactly the same mark that is used. The, the, the mark value is actually the same value. And instead of matching based on the published, uh, we, we basically my match based on the published port. That's the only difference, right? So on internal load balancing, you match against a WIP. On an external load balancer, we actually use the published port. That is the only difference. And once the matching has happened, it basically, um, you know, IPvS does the actual work. One important difference is, though, is that uh, this is something some change that we just recently did. Uh, we were actually trying to redirect the packet to the the target, the, the real container port over here, but we just um, deferred that whole thing over here into um, uh, into the the destination container. Um, there was a, a problem in terms of IPvS connection table entry that we had to fix to kind of fix that, but it also uh, by itself kind of provides a uh, uh, a good uh, scaling, it, it actually adds a good scaling property uh, because this IP table natural, it now gets distributed to the actual container where, where it is actually servicing that particular port rather than being here. Um, and you might, in that case, you might actually see a little bit more number of IP table rules, but those rules get distributed across to the egress side. So that, that kind of you know, um, scaling benefit is achieved overall. Um, so I think I. I have. I mean, I think I've run out of time overall. I don't know if there is a time for Q and A. Yeah, yeah. We can do a, a, a Q and A, and you can talk, come talk to us actually on Birds of Feather tomorrow. Uh, we are going to be there tomorrow for the whole day. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs>